Hi there. I hope you had a nice climb up Baden Hill and we are here at our fifth installment of our Empire unit and we're going to talk about Africa. Uh, like Vietnam, Africa is a uh, part of the world that many students in junior high don't get to learn about and so hopefully we'll be able to introduce some basic concepts so as you move forward you'll be able to build on that foundation. Uh, one of the ways that we need to begin is learning about the the geography of Africa. There are still people, many young people but many adult people, who think Africa is a country. They, they really can't process the size of Africa as a continent and they tend to think of it as one big vague mass and the reality is that uh, Africa is extremely diverse. Like some other parts of the world, maybe Asia, we tend to think of Africa as uh, the same. The word is homogeneous, where we, you know, we think of Africans as being a certain type of person, having a certain background and culture, language. The reality is that Africa has many different groups. Uh, some of them are uh, basically much more uh, aware of the outside world than other groups. And so there's a long tradition of indigenous peoples who maintain their own traditions. And this is honestly, it's frustrated people from outside, people from Europe, uh, even today, people who go to Africa. Uh, people are unable to understand the importance of traditions to the African people and the importance of their communities. And as we explore the meaning of Africa and the identity of Africa, we need to think of how Africa has been influenced by outsiders, how it's been torn apart. Now, this is a story that we have talked about with China and uh, India as well, but Africa is an, an example of how colonization and empire have affected uh, an entire continent and group of people to the point where they still have a hard time industrializing and advancing today so that their quality of life uh, is higher than it is. And when I say quality of life, I'm referring to the idea that people should have a certain way of living. They should have enough to eat. They should have a place to live. Uh, unfortunately, many people from wealthier nations around the world, they think that quality of life means being like Europeans or like Americans. We need to really recognize that human beings uh, can have a high quality of life without having a lot of technology, without having a lot of uh, trade with other people, without having big cities. Uh, so this is very important. Let's not get too locked in on what we think is good for people. With that said, let's talk a little bit about African geography. There are some key S's that you need to know when you try to understand Africa as a continent. And maybe the obvious one is the Sahara. I'm going to say Sahara here, although Sahara is the most common pronunciation. Sahara is a desert and Sahara would be probably a little closer to how people would say that name in Africa. So the Sahara Desert is massive. And, uh, you know, if you understand how uh, wind patterns and precipitation patterns work in the world, that things are along the equatorial band around the, the globe, things are heated, the air is heated, hot air rises and there is a there's a, a circulation of that air and moisture is carried uh, you know evaporation happens moisture is carried carried into the air if you haven't learned how deserts around the world are made that's an important idea i'm not going to go into here but just realize it's pretty predictable you have a desert where the sahara is and um, that doesn't mean that it's always been that way Climate has changed and, you know, you, you don't have to go back that far into human history to see when 
large sections of the Sahara were being used for agriculture. So again, another story for another time. You know that Africa has the, the northern coast and uh, that along the eastern or that's along the western side you have this uh, indentation okay so the the northern part is called in in some uh, histories it's called the barbary coast this is the northern coast and it includes countries like libya tunisia uh, algeria so those areas were closest to europe and bordered the Mediterranean Sea. And so they have a Mediterranean climate, more or less, and uh, some of the same features, products, they have olive vineyards and, or olive uh, groves, and uh, that's a major product, olive oil, um, dates, things like that. And uh, that area was an area that the Europeans knew for centuries and centuries back. You remember Carthage. Carthage was an ancient empire in what is today Tunisia, and Carthage was a rival to Rome. And in fact, I mean, it could have been Carthage that created an empire and took over the world, but it wasn't. So North Africa uh, is coastal, and you don't have to go too far inland before things start getting to be a very dry climate and you enter the Sahara Desert. Below the Sahara Desert, you have basically we call it the coast of the desert. And the word that we're looking for is Sahel. So Sahara, Sahel. Sahel is the coast, the coastline of the desert, the end of the desert. And it's a band across Africa that uh, is a transition zone and it has a, a less extreme climate. And um, after the Sahel, you have another S, you have Savannah. And Savannah usually is, a, it, it represents an area that has a lot of grasslands. So Sahara, Sahel, Savannah, and then you get into the tropical rainforest. And that is what many people think of when they think of Africa, they think of these deep, rainforests that maybe were unexplored by a lot of people uh, even into the 1800s. On the other side, toward the south of the tropical rainforest, you have more savanna. So savanna borders the two sides of the tropical rainforest. And uh, finally, you have Mediterranean climate and desert down on at the southern part of Africa again. So those are the climate zones of Africa, and I think that's helpful as we try to understand how it's organized um, and how people have developed. So when we talk about sub-Saharan Africa, that's, that's going to be very different from Northern Africa, North Africa. Uh, you know that there's an Atlantic coast and there's a coast along the Indian Ocean. So Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean are, are the main ocean influences on uh, Africa and some of the most famous rivers that you should know from Africa, the Nile, of course. You have the Congo River Estuary. That's a, a, an incredible uh, river network that uh, has been used to navigate the continent throughout the, the centuries. You have the Zambezi River. Uh, so those are probably the three most famous rivers. Uh, the Nile River is the longest river in the world, and people long tried to seek out the source of the Nile. It was almost like this magical land, this magical thing that they wanted to find. And uh, we know that the source of the Nile is in Uganda, and uh, there is a uh, very famous landmark there too called the Victoria Falls, named for Queen Victoria, but it's been there a lot longer than Victoria. And Victoria Falls is uh, the highest falls in the world, and it's massive waterfall, bigger than Niagara. And so um, there are just many amazing geographical features in Africa. In addition, 
you should you should know that there are traditional names for the coasts of Africa. You have, again have the Barbary Coast or the North North African Coast. Uh, you have uh, what's called the Gold Coast, and that's where gold trade was conducted for millennia, for thousands of years. You have the Slave Coast, which is very important for understanding the Atlantic slave trade. And uh, you have at the southern tip of Africa, you have a cape, just like you have a cape along the southern part of South America. South America's cape is called, is called Cape Horn. And uh, I guess because it looks like a horn. And the southern part of Africa is the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, when you go up the other side of Africa, you end up with, uh, that's the Swahili coast. And Swahili is a, is a language and it's also a group of peoples who settled uh, the eastern African coast. A uh, couple other features. You should know about Mount Kenya and Mount Kilimanjaro to 19,000 foot plus mountains, massive mountains. Now, to put it in perspective, Mount Everest is 29,000, 10,000 feet higher. The mountains of the Rocky Mountains are mostly 14,000 range. Um, finally, just some, some human features, uh, cities that you should know uh, from the past. Timbuktu, right? You hear that thrown around a lot and it was an exotic city that uh, maybe made people think of the farthest reaches of civilization. And Timbuktu was a very important learning center uh, during several kingdoms, several African kingdoms, and, and on into the period when uh, Europeans were starting to understand Africa more and, and have trade with Africa. So that's a little bit about the geography of Africa. Let's talk now about some kingdoms that arose in Africa, and I'm going to have to go through these quickly. I can see I'm, I'm already halfway through my time. Uh, so African kingdoms, there are usually three that are mentioned, and the oldest is the kingdom of Ghana. Now today there is a modern country of Ghana. It's not exactly in the same location. African peoples and countries cling to their traditions and they often try to associate their country with an ancient kingdom. So Ghana is the oldest one. My brother lived in the modern day country of Ghana and he worked to uh, create health clinics and then he worked there for the Centers for Disease Control, working with the African people on health education. And so, you know, Ghana is actually uh, a democracy. It's an old democracy. It, it's English speaking uh, and stable, relatively stable. So. That's, that's something to kind of think about. But back in uh, the, the early centuries AD, you had a kingdom of Ghana that mainly traded gold for salt. The gold for salt trade is extremely important to understand because you need to know that salt is an important part of people's diets, especially in that region where you, know, the, you had the, the, the Sahara uh, and the need for people, to, they, they were losing salts and so they needed salt in their diet. Also to flavor things and preserve things, of course. So what people would actually do is they, they would trade salt, which was precious, for gold, which was also precious. And Ghana had a lot of gold. And so Ghana, uh, you know, they would trade, but they would also make a lot of money for, uh, from people, traders, caravans who were passing through their territory. So not only did they make money from actual products, they made money from the taxes that they could levy. Ghana was succeeded by the Kingdom of Mali. Now Ghana was not, uh, it was a traditional African kingdom, but Mali was a Muslim kingdom. So this is uh, after the seventh century, once Muhammad had uh, created Islam and his followers had swept around the world and created a massive empire, uh, including North Africa, uh, what happened was Mali became Muslim. And one of its most famous kings in the 1200s was Mansa Musa. And we'll talk about him in a second, but just know uh, the power of Mali was 
as great or even greater than Ghana. It had extended the, the size of the empire and continued the gold for salt trade and gained a, a huge reputation for its power and its, its luxury. And this is when, you know, Europeans were going through the Crusades and uh, yes, Europe had developed, but it, this was awe-inspiring when Europeans first laid eyes on Mansa Musa and his wealth. Uh, Mali was then succeeded by uh, Songhai. Songhai was the third kingdom, third African kingdom, also Muslim. And uh, it's, it's important to see those three kingdoms as being kind of this African tradition of power before Europeans basically took over. Uh, you should know in Mali, they have a rich tradition of uh, literature and art, and uh, they, need, they, they tell the story of Sunjata. Sunjata was basically uh, their, their creator, their, their, their empire's creator. And uh, the epic about Sunjata is a famous work of literature. Mansa Musa, we mentioned earlier, when he went on a pilgrimage to Mecca, because Muslims are required to make a pilgrimage or journey to Mecca, the holy city where, where uh, Muhammad was born, uh, Mansa Musa made a pilgrimage with thousands of other people who were his servants and carrying gold, baskets and baskets of gold. And again, when Europeans and other Middle Eastern peoples saw Mansa Musa, their, their jaws dropped. They couldn't believe how wealthy he was. And a couple of, well, about a century later, you have uh, Askia Muhammad, again, a Muslim leader. But Askia Muhammad was one who believed that being an emperor, a Mansa, meant more than just conquering people, but it meant being responsible for your people's culture. And what he did was he, he supported Timbuktu as a center of learning. And so Askia is known for his, uh, his humility, his desire to uh, know about other cultures and, and to bring people together. And uh, he was eventually overthrown by his son. So I guess the, the path of peace didn't continue. Two more kingdoms traditions that I need to mention. One is Great Zimbabwe. Great Zimbabwe, again today, there's a nation called Zimbabwe. It wasn't always called that, but Great Zimbabwe is kind of a mysterious civilization uh, where they had a, a very complex uh, set of cities, walled cities that had uh, very advanced civilized infrastructure, uh, you know, things like plumbing and, and uh, well-organized housing and all that, uh, but basically it was abandoned. And archaeologists, historians don't know why exactly it was abandoned. It's perhaps because of a plague. But um, so Great Zimbabwe was a great trading power uh, close to the Swahili coast, the eastern coast of Africa. Finally, I want to mention a later tradition, the Zulus. Now the Zulus are a South African tribal group and the Zulus were extremely powerful when uh, Great Britain, the UK, was starting to take over parts of Africa. And they were especially uh, strong near what today is South Africa. And uh, they had a leader named Shaka Zulu. Uh, and Shaka Zulu, he didn't rule for very long, only about 10 years, but he had a great impact on the identity of the Zulu people and the way they fought. They fought in close quarters. Uh, the Greeks would have called this a phalanx, where they were tight together and they had these canvas shields and they had these deadly spears. And, and they were amazingly powerful as an army. And so other tribes, in order to defend themselves against the Zulus, they actually adopted Zulu techniques. And so the, the Zulu culture of for warfare, it, it spread to neighboring kingdoms, we think of the Swazi Kingdom and Lesotho. And even today on a map, you see South Africa and then you see little pockets, two pockets 
uh, Swaziland and Lesotho, and you need to know that that goes back to the 1800s and before when you had these different rival tribal groups, but all of them kind of are connected to the Zulu tradition. So you have these traditions of Africa that we don't learn enough about, and I can't tell you so much about them in, in such a short video, but Europeans obviously had contact with Africa all the way back to the Romans and before the Greeks. And uh, the the northern coast was seen as a, a place of barbarians, right? The Barbary Coast. The Berbers were a tribal group, and that's where we get the name Barbary Coast. Incidentally, the uh, there was an area in Gold Rush, San Francisco called the Barbary Coast, where there were a lot of saloons and a lot of uh, gambling and, and crime and stuff like that, and people getting shanghaied. That means they were basically kidnapped from a bar after they drank too much and they were shung, taken to Shanghai on a boat. They just woke up on a ship and they were suddenly, you know, made to be sailors, uh, basically slaves. Well, anyway, the Barbary Coast in San Francisco does have a connection to the northern coast of Africa. Slavery. Okay, there is a long tradition of slavery all over the world, and the Barbary Coast was one place where slavery did happen all the way back into ancient time. But you need to know the Greeks had slaves, the Romans had slaves. We see it in the Bible. There is a tradition of slavery that doesn't mean that it's okay. And this is what people have used throughout the centuries. They've tried to justify slavery, saying it's in the Bible. Well, that's just evil and false. We know that. So uh, where did slavery come from as we know it? You know, the reason the Civil War in the United States was fought. Well, again, this is in a nutshell. Uh, we have to go back to when the first Europeans began to explore Africa along the, the western coast. Uh, you know that Portugal and Spain became the first real colonial European powers. Tiny Portugal developed the ability to explore. And because of that, because of their ability to explore, they um, started to expand down the coast. And the, the man who gets the credit for Portuguese exploration is Henry the Navigator. He was a prince of Portugal. Prince Henry the Navigator. Uh, he created a school for explorers. And Columbus would have learned at that school, and he would have been a part of the Portuguese expeditions into Africa. And uh, one thing that took place was as Portugal started to establish colonies, um, you know that other people learned from them, the Spanish learned from them, and Columbus joined the Spanish and went, went west, right? And uh, once he started exploring and discovering things, discovering places in the, the West Indies, uh, and the Portuguese had explored the East Indies, what we say is uh, Indonesia today, basically you have a rivalry between the two Catholic countries, Portugal and Spain. And so the Pope, because he didn't want Catholics fighting Catholics, he basically decided that there needed to be a line. He was the referee deciding that Portugal was going to get all the colonies on one side of the line and Spain would get the colonies on the other side of the line. And that is why around the world there was drawn this line. And uh, you can see that in South America to the west of this line called the, the it's called the, uh, well, it was from the Treaty of Tordesillas. It was a line of demarcation. And to the west, you have Peru, Chile, all the all the explorations that the, the Spanish had done. And to the east, you have Brazil, which is the main Portuguese colony in South America. A tiny Portugal was able to control this massive colony of Brazil. Uh, and so that was one thing that happened. But you need to know that the Portuguese continued their explorations down the coast of Africa. Uh, and um, I'm going to you know, just review again the coasts of Africa. You have the Barbary Coast, you have the Gold Coast, 
you have along uh, the eastern side of Africa, you have the, the Skeleton Coast, and it's an incredibly dangerous, barren wasteland in Namibia, present-day Namibia. And you can literally walk down the beach and see all these wrecks of, of ships uh, that because it's just this terribly dangerous place to sail your, your ship. Uh, and then up the, the other side of Africa is the Swahili Coast. Okay, so the Portuguese, their philosophy was, well, first of all, they just, they couldn't get very far inland because the African kingdoms were too strong. They couldn't make inroads. And so they had to be content just having outposts along the coast of Africa. And what they did then is they sailed their ships along the coast to where the cities were. And they uh, said, are you gonna trade with us or not? And if the African king there said, no, we're not gonna trade with you. Then the Portuguese started bombarding the city. And that was how they uh, established forts along the, the coast of Africa. Well, the Portuguese couldn't maintain an empire very long. They were tiny and they had rivals. Uh, we would say that the golden century of the Portuguese was the 15, 15th century, the 1400s. The golden century of the Spanish was the 1500s. But eventually in Africa, you know, the, the, the Portuguese held on through the 1500s, but then they were overtaken by the Dutch. And so the 1600s is the golden century of the Dutch. And the Dutch took over all the outposts of uh, the Portuguese. And they, they rose to ascendancy and say they, you know, they ascended to power. Uh, now, what are the legacies of the Portuguese and the Dutch in Africa? First of all, you need to know that the Portuguese did establish the first sugar plantation and they used slaves that they got from uh, the Bight of Biafra. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it's close to Benin and uh, it's, it's a, uh, a place that has a terrible legacy of, of slavery over the centuries. There's another colony that the Dutch, uh, the, the Portuguese established, which was Angola. And Angola was a source of just thousands and thousands of the slaves, millions, really, millions of the slaves that went to the United States, the colonies and then the United States. Uh, there were 8 million slaves from, uh, you know, Angola and the Bight of Biafra, which is kind of near Cameroon today. And so we're talking about millions of Africans. Many were men. Often the, the children and the women were left behind because the local Africans, they were actually selling slaves and they usually sold prisoners of war to be slaves to somebody else. But they kept the women because they could obviously intermarry with these women and the children could be assimilated. They could be made into Africans uh, from Angolans from that area. So that's kind of how the mechanism of slavery worked. And then, uh, you know, Angola today bears the scars of that slavery. Remember, 8 million Africans taken. Also Cape Town, you need to know that the Dutch established that Southern colony at the, at, uh, the Cape of Good Hope and it was Cape Town and the British then took it over later. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how the trade in slaves developed. Just know that, you know, the Portuguese had slaves, but it wasn't quite as, as dramatic as when there was a reason to export slaves to the colonies in the New World. And so uh, when tobacco became uh, a cash crop in the colonies, more slaves were imported. And then cotton was the massive reason that uh, slaves were imported from places like Angola. And the cotton gin took out the seeds out of the cotton and it made it possible for you know, cotton to be such a valuable product for the United States uh, and that cotton would be made into textiles and cloth. And so what you had developed was a triangular trade 
Uh, specifically now the British were carrying things back and forth. And so they carry, the British carried raw materials from uh, the United States uh, to Europe. And in Europe, those raw materials, cotton was made into textiles and, and you know, ores were made into finished manufactured goods. Those products then were taken to Africa. They were traded with the kings there for slaves. And then slaves were taken to the United States, the colonies, in order to continue harvesting cotton. That was the triangular trade of the Atlantic slave trade. And again, the slave coast, the Bight of Biafra, which is basically the, the indentation of Africa. Uh, looks like an armpit, unfortunately. I'm sorry to call it that, but that's what some people call it. Uh, and Cameroon is a country that was terribly affected by the slave trade there before it was called Cameroon. Uh, the first sugar plantation is was on the island of Sao Tome. Sao Tome uh, is important to Remember, it's a tiny country in Africa, but it has that legacy of being the model for sugar plantations eventually in the West Indies, places like Jamaica and uh, Haiti. Uh, so the, the place where the slaves went across the Atlantic Ocean, that was called the Middle Passage. And it was a horrible, terrible experience, a terrible evil uh, crossing in ships crammed together with less space than you would have in a coffin. That was the middle passage that carried slaves in the triangular trade uh, of this Atlantic slave trade. So how did the English and French get involved in Africa and the slave trade and all that we've been talking about? Well, first of all, you know that Europe had been interacting with North Africa. And so uh, France had kind of a foothold in Algeria. They, they wanted to get resources from Algeria. They grew grain there. They got olive oil. Those products would actually help Napoleon supply his armies so that they could, you know, Napoleon was an emperor and he was trying to expand his empire to be like Alexander the Great or one of the Caesars of Rome. And so he extended his empire and he wanted to take over Egypt. And so he used Algeria as kind of an engine to get grain so he could invade Egypt. But it didn't work for Napoleon to be in charge of Egypt. He left, he left some of his, uh, uh, you know, soldiers, his generals in charge of Egypt and they, they couldn't do very well. They, they weren't able to cross over the cultures. And, and, and uh, so eventually the French would abandon uh, Egypt. It was taken over by a Muslim empire called the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire always kind of was like a, a puppet master controlling Egypt until the, the 1800s. The, the middle of the 1800s saw uh, the rise of a man named Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was responsible for modernizing Egypt. And uh, it's important to know Egypt was a kingdom all the way back, you know, thousands of years ago, 3000 BC, but it was colonized and taken over. And um, so I, I, I didn't mention the other kingdoms, you, you know, ancient kingdoms of Egypt, you had Egypt, then to the south of Egypt, you had uh, Kush, and that's mentioned in the Bible. Kush today is called Sudan, Sudan, and uh, that was also called Nubia. So Kush or Nubia was kind of the southern part. So we call it Upper Egypt because remember the Nile flows from a higher elevation to a lower one. So it's upper, even though it's south of Egypt. Uh, you should also know about Ethiopia, which was a Christian kingdom from 500 AD on. It's also known as Aksum in the Bible and uh, Abyssinia. So those are other names for Ethiopia. So Egypt and Ethiopia were strong kingdoms, even back in biblical times, but they had been influenced by other groups, had fallen into decline. The, you know, Alexander the Great had conquered Egypt and the Romans had, had taken over Egypt. And so they were very weak for, for centuries. And uh, finally, you have this man, Muhammad Ali, who, and not the boxer, of course, but he is trying to modernize and he wants to build textile mills, uh, industrialize Egypt so that 
the cotton that is grown in Egypt doesn't just get shipped somewhere else, but they can actually make their own cotton cloth. But France and England, they don't want Egypt to have that self-sustainability, that self-sufficiency. And so you have the beginnings of meddling. Uh, basically what happened is uh, you know, Muhammad Ali and then Muhammad Ali's grandson, Ismail, uh, Khedive Ismail, basically they, they wanted to modernize Egypt, but the only way they could do it was to borrow money. And so they sold shares in, first of all, the French built the canal, the Suez Canal. So they kind of allowed French, the French to have that stake in Egypt. And then they uh, started selling shares to France and England. Well, France and England, they're industrialized nations and Egypt is still very weak. And, and France and England say, hey, we don't trust our investment. You know, if there are any warlords that are gonna fight over the Suez Canal, we don't want that to happen. So they sent in troops. Britain sent in troops and basically took over the Suez Canal and took over control of Egypt. And that is a legacy that, that is true throughout Africa. Um, some other names you should know, you should know Livingston, who was uh, Dr. Livingston. He was a missionary and also an explorer. He explored the Congo River. He mapped it. He mapped the Zambezi River. His it, first intention was to share Christianity, but he also was an instrument of colonization, European colonization in, in uh, Africa. Another name you need to know is Stanley. Stanley is a last name. And Stanley was, he's basically a journalist, but he was used as a wheeler dealer. He was somebody who was used by kings. Uh, King Leopold II of Belgium was able to use Stanley as kind of an administrator and a PR person so that King Leopold II was able to get control of Congo, a massive area that became the private colony of King Leopold II. Well, He's responsible then in about 1870 for setting off a chain reaction that's called the Scramble for Africa. Okay, this is European nations have become industrialized and they're competing. And so, you know, Africa is the last pie left and they're going to go and they're going to all get their piece of the pie. And so forget about all those ancient kingdoms of Africa. It's going to be European powers coming in and taking over. And that Scramble of Africa is especially uh, acute in 1884 and 85 when you had the the berlin conference which was the the real it, it's pathetic because no africans were invited to this conference and all the european representatives basically said okay let's divide up africa this is an important event that uh gave power to germany because the conference was in berlin and the chancellor bismarck uh, he became very powerful and Germany continued to become more and more powerful until eventually you have things like World War One and World War Two in the next century. Uh, World War One led to a complete remapping of the continent because, you know, these uh, everything had to be changed because Germany lost and they had to give up all their African colonies. And, and you know, France and England basically had to create new countries from their colonies. And this was the beginning of decolonization, but it would take another 35 years before all the nations of Africa would become independent. Um, finally, you have entrepreneurs, businessmen who discover things in Africa and take advantage of, of the resources of Africa, particularly in the South. You have diamonds discovered uh, at Kimberley. Uh, in, the, in South Africa, Southern Africa. Uh, you need to know that a colony then was formed called Rhodesia. There was Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia. Northern Rhodesia is the modern nation of Zambia. Southern Rhodesia is now called Zimbabwe. We said Great Zimbabwe earlier. Well, Cecil Rhodes was the businessman who made all his money in the Kimberley Diamond Mines, and he actually founded the De Beers Diamond Company, which you probably have heard of, De Beers. I mean, they still dominate the diamond industry today. Uh, Rhodesia was an example of how one man could control a huge part of the world and its resources and basically continue the idea of slavery. Uh, Africans were paid one-tenth of what white workers were paid and their conditions were 
were slave-like. So even after slavery was abolished, there were still slaves in Africa and beyond. Um, and in South Africa, you know, after the Dutch lost control of their colony, there were some wars called the Boer Wars between the, the Dutch settlers called Afrikaners and the British, new colonial British, who were taking over the, the, the colony of South Africa, the Cape Town or Cape Colony. And eventually um, you had this discrimination that developed. You have a tiny minority of uh, white Europeans and they dominated the 90% or so who were indigenous Africans. And uh, that led to policies that took away the rights of Africans, put them on reservations, very similar to what happened in the United States, and then created the policy of apartheid. Apartheid was the official legal policy, generally seen as starting in World War II and beyond, but it happened even before separating the races in South Africa, one of the greatest evils of human history. And finally, in the 1990s, it was overturned and apartheid was no more. So much to tell about Africa. Uh, I hope that you are stimulated, inspired by some of these topics and go out and find out more. Thanks. Bye-bye.